Do you know how to bring out the best in others at work? Let's see what the science suggests. Hi there, Michelle here from Shell McQuay TV. We're helping you find ways to move from functioning to flourishing by putting the latest science to the real world test. Now, Jack Welsh once noted, when you were made a leader, you weren't given a crown. You were given the responsibility to bring out the best in others. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. But after more than a decade in senior leadership roles right around the world, it became increasingly clear to me that despite their best intentions, most leaders have no idea where to start. You see, people are often appointed to leadership roles because they're technically excellent at what they do. And while they may be given some traditional training in how to communicate, negotiate, manage a budget and comply with their legal requirements of their role, very few are taught how people's brains and bodies are wired to perform at their best. And as a result, in an increasingly complex and uncertain business environment, many leaders are struggling to bring out the best in themselves and the teams they're leading. But as one CEO recently asked me, where's the roadmap to becoming a positive leader? Well, drumroll please. It's a great question. <laughs> and at present, researchers have been unable to agree that any such roadmap exists. But what we do have to guide us in the meantime are a number of well-developed theories of well-being that focus on how you can help people to feel good and to function effectively. Now, just in case you're thinking, well-being may be a bit soft for a leader to unleash great performances, I recommend taking a look at the growing body of research that suggests employees with higher levels of well-being are more engaged, more productive, sell more, have happier customers, make better leaders and are less likely to burn out at the office. There's nothing soft about those kind of bottom line results. Of course, when it comes to ways to improve well-being, one of the most popular theories in recent times is that proposed by Professor Martin Seligman, who suggests that in order to flourish, we need the right balance of positive emotions, the opportunity to be regularly engaged by using our strengths at work, the presence of good relationships, the feeling our work has meaning, and the ability to accomplish goals that matter to us. But just how is a leader expected to put that all together and still do their job? Well, here are five small practical ways that I found to cultivate these wellbeing pillars as a leader in a large organisation where I had no special budget or permission to be cultivating the wellbeing of my team. Firstly, Dr. Daniel Goldman's research suggests that 20 to 30% of performance is determined by the mood of employees. How? Well, studies suggest that when we experience positive emotions like joy, interest, pride, awe or gratitude, for example, it helps to broaden our minds so that we're thinking more creatively and collaboratively whilst building our resources so we're more resilient to deal with the ups and downs that we all experience at work. But do you have a mood strategy for your team? Now, as a leader, I decided that to apply these ideas, I'd think about the way we held our team meetings. To help us start and finish our meetings in the right frame of mind, I injected a little positivity into proceedings with a simple check-in about what was working well, a funny video I could relate to our work, or by sharing a story of gratitude. It didn't mean that we shied away from difficult conversations if we needed to have them, just meant that neurologically we are in a better place to deal with these challenges. Secondly, the Corporate Leadership Council have found that when a manager has a conversation that focuses primarily on an employee's weaknesses, those things they are not doing so well at, afterwards that employee's performance declines on average by 36%. But if the manager focuses the review prim primarily on an employee's strengths, then afterwards that person's performance improves on average by 27%. Now that's quite a difference given that all you're doing is talking. So as a leader, I decided it was worth taking the time to know my team's strengths, the things they liked doing and that they were good at. And I did this by asking them to take the free 10 minute survey at viacharacter.org. And then I made sure once a quarter, I sat down with them and gave them feedback on how I saw their strengths being applied and asked what support did they need to develop these strengths further. Not surprisingly, when we were doing more of what we each did best each day at work, 
our performance improved considerably. Thirdly, studies suggest that our relationships with other people are our best guarantee to lower our levels of stress and improve our concentration and focus in our jobs. This is because each time we genuinely connect with another person, the pleasure-inducing hormone oxytocin is released into the bloodstream, helping to reduce our anxiety and to improve our ability to focus. For an introverted leader like myself, the good news is that scientists have discovered it takes just a micro moment to connect with someone by sharing a positive emotion such as kindness, interest or gratitude, making eye contact or matching body language or vocal tones so that you can synchronize your brain activity, and then investing in the feelings of mutual care and warmth that rise up between you. Now by taking a few minutes at the end of each day to thank someone in person or by phone for how they'd made my work a little easier, a little bit more enjoyable, I was able to not only significantly improve my relationships, but found there was a tidal wave of reciprocated gratitude that was returned for my efforts. Fourthly, for decades Americans have ranked purpose as their top priority in their jobs. Yep even above promotions, income, job security and hours. But can purpose be found in any job? Well, it seems so. You see, a comprehensive analysis of data from more than 11,000 employees across different industries, the single strongest predictor of meaningfulness was found to be the belief that the job had a positive impact on others. Now, as a leader in a large accounting firm where finding meaning in our work felt like looking for a needle in a haystack, the idea that purpose could be built by helping people see the impact they had on others transformed the way I thought about our roles. I started focusing my team not just on what we did each day, but the how we went about it and the positive impact they could have through the way we interacted with our clients and our colleagues. And what had felt like soulless corporate drudgery started to bring on a whole new sense of satisfaction in our work and in our lives when we thought about the impact we had. Then finally, while 89% of people believe that tomorrow will be better than today, only 50% believe that they can make it so. And researchers define this gap as the difference between wishing and hoping, and other things being equal a 14% improvement in productivity of your team. So as a leader, I tried to make sure that at least one of the projects we were pursuing as a team was something we were truly excited about, even if it was more passion than priority. I also did my best to try and knock down the obstacles to make it easier for my team to get their work done, and brought in high hope people from inside and outside our business for us to be inspired by and to learn from. Now, keeping up our hopes was instrumental in our ability to deliver on the goals that we'd been set through some pretty challenging projects. Now, I'm not claiming that any of this was rocket science, but the impact these small changes had on my own performance and that of my team was significant. Nine months later, for the first time ever, we'd exceeded every measure that had been set for us. And while promotions and bonuses flowed, the most rewarding part of this experience was that to this day, people in my team still tell me that working together was one of the highlights of their careers. So are you ready to try a little positive leadership right now? Then share this video with your family and friends, especially those who may need a little lift in the way they're leading others, no matter what their job description says. And if you'd like more practical and playful ideas from the latest science on human flourishing, then be sure to subscribe or stop by michellemcquade.com and leave your name and email address so you can hear all our news first. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching Shell McQuaid TV. Remember, you are good enough, so don't be afraid to let your strength shine. Until next time, take care. Hi there, I'm Michelle McQuaid and I'm a positive leader. I take the time to create a great mood when it comes to my team meetings. I sit down with my team and talk about their strengths. I use gratitude to improve my relationships. I create a sense of meaning and purpose in people's work. And I create a sense of hope that lifts us all and inspires us. How do I do it? 
I'm high as a kite. In fact, I'll be having a doobie as soon as this is done. Take care.